do, do, do. and welcome back everybody to philosophy for the people dr gavin kerr is back again here he is always great to have good to see you, you here gavin yes always a joy so we are continuing our series on uh survivalism and corruptionism and well, first there was the destruction of the destruction, and now we have the corruption of corruptionism. <laughs> so we're, we're into those sorts of, <laughs> sorts of titles, I suppose. And um, this are, is part yeah, two. Yeah. Uh, part one, you sort mm -hmm. of gave a general, let's say, metaphysical case for the um, mm. for the survivalist position. Uh, previously, I've mm -hmm. had uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tomaszewski on, who's, uh, who's advancing mm -hmm. the corruptionist position. Uh, and we explained mm -hmm. some of the his historical uh, details of this debate explained what the camps are this is definitely this is definitely you know uh this is a, de a, a debate among thomists right so it's going to appeal mm -hmm. to uh <laughs> to a certainly specific but highly engaged audience so we enjoy this sort of thing and uh we're going to mm -hmm. just keep you know keep this conversation going a little bit further because there was some more stuff that we wanted to cover i know that you wanted to uh put mm -hmm. on the table from your perspective gavin mm -hmm. so yeah looking forward to this yeah. and thanks for being here again mm -hmm. not not at all Great to be back. So, um, will we just dive in? Let's do it. Take us up. Uh, yeah, okay. I guess wherever you want. Yep, and we'll just we'll move forward from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so as you pointed out, the last time we looked at the general metaphysics of the of the matter. Um, so, uh, in the general metaphysics of the matter, um, the uh, the human substance, like any substance, is a material substance. It's composed of matter and form, and uh, the form of the human being is the rational soul. Um, because the rational soul has operations or, or powers which allow the human to perform certain operations independent of matter, then uh, the rational soul is not uh, fully encompassed by matter. It's a form in matter, but it's not a material form. So the act of existence, um, which the soul mediates to the body, then um, isn't fully encompassed by matter either. Mm -hmm. So when the body decays, um, the soul with its active existence remains. Um, now, this is this will provide a nice sort of um, entryway into some of the contemporary literature on the matter. One uh, point which is often uh, overlooked in these discussions, and it was it was one that um, sort of I was pointing out uh, the last time, um, but it, it sometimes could seem like just a tangential issue, is that for Thomas, whilst a substance is constituted out of its matter and form, what exists is the individual supposit. Okay, mm -hmm. the individual supposit is what exists. That's what exists, and it's constituted by its matter and form. It's not identical to its matter and form. It's constituted by its matter and form, and that's what exists. So it's not the matter or the form that exists. It's the individual supposit that exists. So right. that being the case, the case for survivalism then depends crucially on that, that it's the individual supposit posit that exists because if the same act of existence remains after death as there was before death then it must be the same individual supposit which possesses that act of existence so let me repeat that if the same act of existence um persists after death as there was before death then there must be the same individual supposit suppositing for that act of existence and for you know, the form or the rational soul, which mm -hmm. remains. So it's not the rational soul which exists after death. It's the individual supposit, suppositing for that rational soul, which continues to exist after death. Yeah. The rational okay. soul do mm -hmm. doesn't just fl float about there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's crucial to the metaphysics of the matter. Now, the reason why I bring that up, and that's going to be something that, you know, we keep coming back to, you know, to clarify positions. Mm hmm the reason um, why I bring that up is that in the corruptionist literature, so from the corruptionist authors, they typically speak of the human substance and the human substance having to be a material substance so that when, when that substance decomposes, you no longer have a human being there. Right, well, okay. But you still have the individual supposit um, mm -hmm. with the corruption of the material substance. The supposit still remains because the same act of existence remains. And that is something which is granted by the authors who defend corruptionism, that the same act of existence remains after death. It's not a different act of existence. It's still my act of existence, which remains after death, in which case it's still the individual supposit, which I am, which supposits for that existence after death. Mm -hmm. So that's 
kind of what the, the, the case for survivalism is based on, that right. the immateriality of the soul um, individuating the act of existence means that the individual supposit with that act of existence is what continues to exist, suppositing for that soul, but no longer suppositing um, for the matter that that soul informs. Yes. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? It, it does to me, yep. <laughs> if, if it doesn't to the audience, okay. they can chime in in the comments. We will try, by the way, guys, we will try and do some Q&A uh, towards the end of this one. So if there's any specific questions you have, preferably related to this topic first, if you guys want to go broader than mm -hmm. that later, we if there's time, maybe we will. But related to this debate, please uh, post them in the comments. And we'll try to hit some of those towards the end. So yeah, Gavin, clear as mud. Please continue. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, one thing to bear in mind here is that, um, well, two things to bear in mind here. Uh, one is that um, when it comes to actions, things that are done, okay, actions that are performed, it's mm -hmm. supposits, it's individual supposits which perform actions. So it's not my soul that performs an action. It's not my body that performs an action. I perform the action. It's the by individual, my right, soul. it's you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now, I may be constituted by my soul and my body, but I, as the individual supposit, I'm not identical to it. Now, we often say, like, take intellectual knowledge. We we would say that it's the rational soul that knows or it's the possible intellect that knows. Well, that that's a kind of a loose way of speaking. And Thomas does, does speak like that. But, you know, what, technically, when he has to clarify himself, when he's talking about action, it's the individual subject that knows by means right. of the possible intellect. Mm -hmm. So it's... We talk about the eye seeing, but it's not the eye that sees. The individual sees by means of the eye. That's this right. is going to be mm -hmm. important. Um, this is going to be important when it comes to a particular text um, from St. Thomas, where he talks about the prayer of the saints. And this is something recently um, I heard a talk uh, given by John O'Callaghan to the Thomistic Institute, um, defending corruptionism, that always when Thomas talks about the prayers of the saints, um, he you know, almost always refers to the souls of the saints. And he takes that as a uh, confirmation he takes that as confirmation of the corruptionist position that the individual doesn't remain, that only the soul remains because it's the soul that prays. But, uh, and this is something that we're kind of going to get to because there's a, a text in the Summa where Thomas addresses this and some of the corruptionist authors, you know, refer to this text that if Thomas were a survivalist, he could just point to survivalism to deal with the issue of prayers to the saints, but he doesn't. So that must indicate that he's a corruptionist. Um, in any case, if it's the individual supposit that performs these operations, by means of the soul, then it's the individual that prays. It's not the soul that prays. Mm -hmm. So if the soul exists, you know, without the body in the separated state, but the individual that supposits for that soul doesn't exist, the, the soul can't pray. There has to be mm -hmm. something which supposits for that soul. There has to be an individual that supposits for it in order for it to be able to pray. And if it's an act of existence, then it's the same individual that exists as before and um, after death. Okay, so how, how's all that sound? Good. You Actually, would you mind repeating that, the last like 10 seconds of what you said, because you just kind of broke up a tiny bit there. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry about that. So if it's the individual supposit that performs these operations, say, such as prayer, uh, by means of the soul, then it's not the soul that prays after death. It is an individual suppositing for the soul that prays after death. Got it. Perfect. Good so far? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, so if it's if it's the if it's the same act of existence which subsists after death as subsisted before death, which as we saw in the last episode it is, um, mm -hmm. then it must be the same individual supposit possessing that act of existence which is suppositing for the rational soul after death, mm -hmm. and it's so mm -hmm. that that same individual supposit which is praying by means of the rational soul after death. In other words, it's Saint Peter who prays after death, not the soul of Saint Peter. Right, right. Yes. Good, 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 good. Yeah. So <clears throat> I did not get a chance to listen yeah. to that Thomistic Institute lecture, by the way, but I will link it in the show notes so people can mm. be part of the larger conversation on this. Yeah. So, but yeah, continue, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, um, one of the, uh, I think one of the main reasons, um, that the, uh, well, at least one corruptionist author um, defends corruptionism. Um, aside from, you know, pointing to several texts in Aquinas that seems to suggest that Aquinas affirms this, is that um, uh, 
there's a certain meteorological principle called the weak supplementation principle. And the weak supplementation principle holds that no whole can be constituted by a single part. Okay, mm -hmm. so no whole can be constituted by a single part. If you have a part, there must also be some other part that supplements it to constitute the whole. Right. Mm -hmm. and okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I did so talk about WSP if, with with uh, with Chris in in our in our conversation before because I, we'll we'll get into it. But this is important for people. This is a sort of a general principle in, in muriology. It's not without controversy, but then again, what in philosophy is without controversy, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, given uh, if if we assume the the weak su supplementation uh, principle uh, to be the case then um, you can't have a, a whole individual um, constituted just by one part, which mm -hmm. is, let's say, the soul. So if, um, if I lose my body, then only my soul exists after death, then obviously we don't have the, the whole individual existing after death. And so uh, defenders of the weak supplementation principle and those who would attribute it uh, to St. Thomas uh, would hold then St. Thomas must deny uh, that the individual subsists beyond death, mm -hmm. given the weak supplementation yeah. principle, because only the soul subsists uh, beyond death. Um, and now there's a few ways around that. Um, David Oderberg has a paper um, on this. I, I forget the title of the paper, but it, it, it addresses precisely that, the weak supplementation principle. And he goes into it in some detail. Um, and he argues that, uh, first of all, it's not a universal uh, principle of Mariology. It doesn't uh, com command universal assent. Um, so it, it requires some, you know, philosophical buttressing. Okay, that's fine. Uh, a defender of the weak supplementation principle, you know, is free to, you know, defend it. But David Oderberg just points out that it's it's not as much of a given as maybe some corruptionist authors hold. Uh, the other point to be made there is that corruptionist authors, uh, at least one in particular, um, uh, has held that St. Thomas endorses uh, some form of the weak supplementation principle because um, frequently uh, St. Thomas cites the principle that the whole is greater than the part, okay? That this is a, a, a principle known per se to the wise, that the whole is greater than the part. Um, if the whole is greater than the part, then the whole is not identical to the part, so the, the part has to be supplemented in order to include the whole, okay? So um, that's, you know, where these authors maybe locate the weak supplementation principle in the thought of Aquinas. The problem there, is that um, the one author that I'm thinking about, um, and I don't want to name any names because he's still a living philosopher and he's still out there uh, publishing, but the one author that I'm thinking about too is written on this, um, quotes that principle that the whole is uh, greater than uh, its part, uh, but then uh, translates it to the effect that the whole is greater than each of its parts. So, the, so there's a subtle difference there in the articulation of that principle. St. Thomas articulates the principle almost always. I did an index Thomisticus search on this, and St. Thomas almost exclusively articulates that principle as the whole is greater than its part. Um, whereas this author, having just quoted the principle, changes it to the whole is greater than each of its parts. Thomas talks about the whole being greater than its part. This author changes it to the whole is greater than each of its parts. The reason why I point that out is that if Thomas is saying that the whole is greater than its part as the principle, he recognizes that there can be a whole with only one part because the principle is that the whole is greater than its part. So he recognizes that there can be a whole with only one part. That being the case, what Thomas means by saying the whole is greater than its part need not be what the weak supplementation defenders right, hold, right. that if the whole mm -hmm. is greater than its each of its parts, one mm -hmm. part needs to have several parts in order to have the greater whole. I think mm -hmm. what Thomas is saying when he says that the whole is greater than its part is that the whole is what suppositates for its part and the part would not be realized in being without the whole, which supposits yeah, for it. Yeah, that, that's, okay, that's so interesting. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. So again, it's that supposit nature distinction that the supposit is more fundamental. That's what enjoys existence. Uh, and, you know, you can have a single part which is being supposited for uh, by the whole. Um, but even if w somebody wants to push the weak supplementation principle, we could say, well, the whole is greater than the part because in everything in which essence and existence are distinct, there's always going to be a, a distinction between supposit and nature. 
Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there you have at least two metaphysical components anyway. But I don't even mm -hmm. think you need to go down that line for that. We can just say that, you know, you've got the, the, the whole is greater than the part because the supposit supposits for the part and allows the part to be realized in being. So it's metaphysically more fundamental um, yeah, than the part for which mm -hmm. it's supposits. Mm, so interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that That's how I would address uh, the weak sublimation, sub, uh, supplementation principle. And um, it, it's being found uh, in the thought of Aquinas that. I don't think you can uh, find it in the thought of Aquinas uh, whenever, he, whenever he does say that um, this, uh, the, the whole is greater than the part when he articulates this principle. I don't think he's affirming um, the weak supplementation principle. And if he's not affirming the weak supplementation principle, then it's not a given that um, the survival of the soul alone, okay, w without its body, uh, means the eradication um, of the individual, because you still oh. need an individual supposit, which supposits for the soul. Okay, so let me uh, just summarize um, what I what I hear you saying, Gavin, and you can correct me if, if any of it's off. But you you're you're saying that mm. one, it's it's not clear that Aquinas held uh, WSP, where if there's an object with the proper part, there has to be another distinct proper part that doesn't overlap it. That's a WSP, right? It's not clear mm. that Aquinas actually held that. You mm. gave an interpretation where um, you can read Aquinas as not being committed to that. Uh, and if that's the case, okay, then the survivalist doesn't have to really worry about that. Or even if he did hold WSP, uh, there's still a metaphysical analysis um, uh, available to the survivalist, which avoids the problem anyway. So like, no matter which way you want to go with it, it doesn't seem like WSP is going to end a debate in favor of the corruptionist. Is that is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. So um, there, there, there's more metaphysical work here to be done. Um, I also want to address the point that um, uh, a piece of argumentation um, from the corruptionists is that if the human being decomposes, then you no longer have the individual human. You no longer ha have the person. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's correct. Because um, if we want to say that a human being is the composite of body and soul, and so essentially it, it requires the body, okay, that's fine. But the person is whatever supposits for the rational nature. That's what a person is. It's what supposits for the rational nature. And as long as you have the same supposit, the same person can subsist, even if the human being, which for the sake, you know, for definitional purposes, is something with a body, even if the human being decomposes you can still have the it's same correct. human person uh subsisting and obviously in an incomplete state because as he is without his body but let's say st peter still subsists because the individual supposit still subsists right. um mm -hmm. and no um now i haven't read all of the corruptionist literature but in the the main authors you know who've set the frame of reference for the debate none of them mention this supposit nature distinction none of them um I, yeah and in mm -hmm. the Go on. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think you're right about that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I haven't seen it. And also many of them tend to, um, uh, Sorry. yeah, you still with me? Sorry. Can you hear me now? Little internet issues going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, um, sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry. You were going to come in there. Yeah. So like you, uh, you're, you're right. I've not encountered that in the literature. And then there's also, um, others who, uh, avoid either uh, intentionally because they, they think it's a it's a distraction or they just don't um, think it's important to the debate um, the nature of personhood what a person actually is um, now I thought that that always is relevant to the debate so if you're not going to get into that uh, then we need a good reason of, of why that that's some sort of a distraction or not relevant to the debate now you're kind of putting forth mm -hmm. the traditional Boethian understanding of, of a person. Right. Um, so yeah, I don't know, maybe you want to talk a little bit more about that too. Um, mm, because I yeah. think even in the conversation with Chris and I don't want to focus on Chris too much because he's, he's a friend and he's just not here to defend himself right now. But I think we even brought up, um, mm. how he would define person. And yeah, I think, I yeah. think he even said, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. That's, that's, that's distraction. And, uh, that was fine. That was the way he wanted to take it. I didn't uh, push the issue, but I've always felt that, no, this is an important aspect of this debate. If we want to know if the person survives bodily death, then we better get clear on what a, per <laughs> what a person is. <laughs> right. <laughs> so yeah. Any, any comments you want to make about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, 
I mean, if, I think if we're going to talk about, say, St. Peter, you know, and uh, I see somebody's already brought it up in the questions, you know, the famous article, you know, from the Secunda Secunda about, you know, the prayer of um, uh, the prayer of the saints after death, that it's, you know, uh, the the soul of such and such, you know, who prays, you know, says Thomas concedes that's not St. Peter. Um, well, uh, well, we are going to get to that, you know, uh, it, he doesn't really um, concede that at all because he talks about the saints, you know, meriting um, to be able to pray. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we will get into that, but, um, with regard to the person, the per person, as, as Thomas always points out, is the individual supposit, okay, of a rational nature. Um, and we always have this, uh, supposit and nature distinction in Aquinas' thought whenever you have, um, composition of, uh, essence and existence. Anything which is composed of essence and existence, um, is composed of supposit and nature. Um, right. so the supposit is not identical to the nature for which it supposits. Thomas is very clear on that. Um, and that's even the case for the angels, um, uh, in Quad Libe 2, question two, um, thereabouts, um, St. Thomas argues that, you know, if you've got a composition of essence and existence, then there's something in the, in the individual which is not identical to the individual's nature. So the individual which has that nature also has something extra to it. And so the, indivi the individual isn't identical to either of those components, i.e. the individual isn't identical to either his essence or his existence. That's mm -hmm. the case for the angels. That's the case for us. So I, as an individual, suppose it then I'm not identical to my soul or to my body. Um, so if it's that I, that individual I, the, the person that I am, which um, enjoys the act of existence, if that act of existence still remains after death, then I still remain after death. I don't think there's any way of getting around that in St. Thomas's metaphysics. If the individual act of existence remains after death, then the individual supposit, which enjoys that act of existence, um, remains after death. We can say we, we we can say for definitional purposes the human being is the bodily thing, right? Okay, so the human being, you know, uh, goes away, but that doesn't mean that the the human individual, you know, St. Peter or myself or whatever, what's supposited um, for that composed nature um, right. ceases to be because it's that same supposit which uh, enjoys its active existence uh, after death. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So your 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 case here is is mm -hmm. it's very clear. Uh, it's very it's very good as well. Like I said, I, I entered this debate as a really sort of a genuine agnostic uh, on on this issue, and I also want to say that it's mm -hmm. not one that I've spent a terrible amount of time researching. So when I say that I haven't uh, seen um, the points you've brought up in the literature, don't don't take that as dispositive because I. I'm not a master of the literature on this on this topic, right? <laughs> but it, it, certainly, as far as I've gone, that 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 seems that seems correct. So, um, and let me just also reiterate that there's kind of two things we're considering uh, in this debate. One is what's true always, right? Is survivalism true? Is corruptionism true? And like true, like according to general Thomistic principles, because it might be the case that Thomas had the right principles, but uh, they were um, wrongly applied for whatever reason. And I think there are instances of that. In fact, I think I just published an article with Catholic Answers about later insolment. And I said that, look, Aquinas just had empirical facts wrong. I think his principles are right and we can make easy adjustments on that. So I think that I think that's a case where Aquinas did reach a false conclusion with good principles just mm -hmm. poorly applied for empirical reasons, right? So it could just be the case that you can hold on to the principles and and make adjustments uh, because there is some faulty application for whatever reason. Uh, and so you might have a conclusion that you think is true according to a Thomistic framework that Thomas himself did not hold. That's one that's one way you could go with this. But I think, Gavin, you want to I think you want to go further. Right. You want to say, no, it, the survival position is true. And it's actually what Thomas himself believed. Is that is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. OK, that's, a, that's exactly uh, the position I'm making. Um, okay, so um, to get it to the, the prayers of the saints now, and the, the, the famous, you know, sort of uh, uh, objection reply, you know, from question 83, article 11, uh, from the Secunda Secunde. So um, there's one author who zones in on this. So after this author sets up the weak supplementation principle and says, given this principle, we have to deny survivalism, affirm corruptionism, um, that this author goes on to say, well, look, there's some texts in Aquinas as well, partic 
particularly when he talks about the soul not being identical to the individual I, um, that will affirm, will lead us to assume that Thomas is affirming corruptionism, that he has to have a corruptionist framework in mind in order to affirm that. Um, the first thing I want to say before we get on to the prayers of the saints is that, um, yes, the soul is is not the individual. Hey, nobody, you know, is saying that it is. Everybody agrees on that. And what I've sort of been affirming for the last, we've been on for about 25 minutes now, individual supposit, which is the I. Okay, so Peter is the individual supposit. Gavin is the individual supposit. Supposits for the soul. Okay, so we couldn't be identical to the soul. There's a distinction between supposit and nature and everything composed of essence and existence. So the individual supposit cannot be identical to that nature, which is the soul. Yes, we thoroughly affirm that. But it's the supposit that enjoys the act of existence. So just because the eye isn't identical to the soul doesn't mean that the eye doesn't subsist because the soul is not the only thing which remains after death. It's the supposit with its act of existence which remains after death, after death constituted by the soul, but not identical to the soul. It's that individual supposit. The soul doesn't exist. It's not the soul which is the subject of existence. That's not what's subject to the act of existence. It's the individual supposit which is subject to the act of existence, and it's constituted now just by its soul but identical mm. to it. So it's kind of like in the state of an angel. An angel, okay, an individual angel, the angel's nature isn't what enjoys the act of existence. It's the individual angel, the supposit, that enjoys the act of existence. And it is constituted by its angelic nature, whatever it is, the na mm. nature of St. Michael, the nature of real, or, or whatever. Okay, same for the soul. It's not the soul which enjoys the act of existence. It's the individual supposit which supposits for the soul. And it's the same here. It's not my body or my soul or the composite of body and soul which enjoys the act of existence. I enjoy the act of existence and I supposit um, for my body. And soul. So it's that supposit which remains after death, which is not identical to the soul. So saying that the I, okay, is not identical to the soul is a slam dunk for the corruptionist because we all agree on that. Uh, we ju I just deny that it's only the soul which continues to exist after death because if you have the same act of existence after death, you have the same supposit after death as before death. Right. Only this time, the supposit is suppositing only for the soul, whereas before death, it's suppositing for the opposite of body and soul. So, okay, that, that's yeah. the first mm -hmm. point to be made. Okay, just to, just, yeah, just no, to that, keep that's good. To that's, bear that in mind. That, yeah, no, that's that's very good. I'm glad you put that back in the in 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 view for us. So, yeah, continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's have a look at question eighty three, article. Um, Article what, Article Eleven Objection Eleven five. Objection so Five. So got it up here, right. right? Further, the soul of Peter is not so Peter. Yes, if therefore the souls of the saints pray for us, so long as they are separated from their bodies, we ought not to call upon Saint Peter, but on his soul to pray for us. That yet the church does the contrary. The saints therefore do not pray for us, at least before the resurrection. So the objection there is being made is that given that Saint Peter is identical to um, his soul. Um, and it's only the soul that survives, uh, we need to call upon the souls of the saints to pray for us, but the church doesn't. The ch church calls upon the saints to us, so the objection there is that, um, well, you know, the saints can't pray for us until the soul is reunited to the body at the resurrection. So it's only at the resurrection that um, the saints can offer up prayers for us, not in that separate state. So Aquinas' response Let's just get it up here. Um, and, and, and this is a response that, you know, um, this corruptionist author really focuses on and says, look, if Aquinas was a survivalist. He could have just affirmed survivalism here and didn't have to give the answer that he did. But given that he doesn't affirm survivalism and he gives this sort of odd sort of answer, that must mean he has a corruptionist um, sort of viewpoint in mm -hmm. mind. So reply to objection five. It is, it is because the saints while living merited to pray for us that we invoke them under the names by which they were known in this life and by which they are better known to us and also in order to indicate our belief in the resurrection according to the saying of exodus i am the god of abraham so on and so forth okay so what's that reply saying so it's because the saints while living merited to pray for us 
Okay, so the saints, while living, merited to pray. So St. Peter himself merited to pray. So who is the one praying then? Okay, so the saints, St. Peter merited to pray. So he merited, while living, to pray for us after death. So who's the one praying? St. Peter. The individual supposit that is St. Peter is the one praying. Moving on. We invoke them under the names by which they were known in this life. Okay, how do we know St. Peter? He was the fisherman at Galilee, you know, he was crucified upside down on the cross. He was the bodily individual that we, you know, refer to. I've never seen a soul. I can't designate a soul because I've never seen it. A soul is not a perceptual entity. So there is not a kind of, you know, a theory of descriptions or, you know, a kind of a theory of reference which will allow me to designate a soul and say, there's St. Peter, or an individual mm -hmm. opposite and say, there is St. Peter, because, you know, We've only known St. Peter as perceptual entities, so we refer to him given what we know about him in this life. But it's the supposit now existing, you know, after death immaterially, the same supposit, which is, you know, the St. Peter, um, which is praying for us, and we refer to him as St. Peter, um, the name by which he was known to us in this life, precisely because that's perceptually how we knew him. Because mm. we can't, you know, refer to, it's, we can't see the soul, we can't see the supposit of some constituted by the soul um in which case we have uh we have to refer to him by you know all that we knew about him in this life as you know first pope you know fisherman from God, all of that um so let me just get back to the uh the reply to the objection okay and by which they are better known to us and also in order to indicate our belief in the resurrection so um but belief in the resurrection according to the saying of of Exodus 3 6, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of that. Um, so that's referring to um, what Christ did. You know, remember the Sadducees, you know, challenge him, you know, uh, who don't believe in the resurrection. And Christ says, Look, when God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's the God of the living, which means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. They're still living, they still exist because he is the God of the living. But if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or, you know, let's, you know, Moses and Elijah, you know, at uh, Mount Tabor, the Transfiguration, if they're existing in a separated state and God is the God of the living, then it means that Moses and Elijah are still alive because their individual supposit remains. And because the deposit remains, they're able to pray for us. Remember, prayer is an operation that you do through the soul, but it's not what the soul does. It's what the in individual supposit does. So it's me as an individual supposit that prays by means of my soul. So if it was only the soul existing after death and not the supposit, the soul couldn't pray mm. because there's nothing suppositing for the soul. So there has to be something suppositing for the soul which prays after death. If that is a different supposit from the one that existed before death, then it's a different act of existence, different soul, something completely different, mm -hmm. which is absurd. Because if it's the same act of existence, same individual soul, then it's the same individual supposit, suppositing um, for that soul. And that's what remains. And that's the individual which is St. Peter in an incomplete state without his body, but still the individual St. Peter. Yeah, that's excellent. I just want to highlight this uh, comment by Mount Athos. He says, good points. The supposit nature distinction is winning me over. I knew about this distinction prior, but it's clearer now. Um, so you go, Gavin. You're... <laughs> putting some points on the board here <laughs> <laughs> well it, it, it's funny um so uh i was um i was chatting with um i don't think she'll mind me saying i was chatting with elnor stump about it um and uh, I, I sent her a message and i said you know what do you think you know this you know and it, it seems to me that this supposed nature distinction is what's missing um from this discussion um and, you know i mean she just came back and says yeah you know it's you know good point because that doesn't appear in the literature but she came back uh, with a really interesting point um to me uh, um and i have to give her full credit because it's not something that occurred to me before um and thomas is very clear on this when it comes to individuation the substantial form is what gives corporeality to matter okay so the substantial form is what makes matter corporeal. St. Thomas believes in the unicity of substantial form. There's only one substantial form. The Franciscans, um, and I believe Bavicena as well, held the pl plurality of forms. There's at least two forms. There's a form which gives corporeity to prime matter. And then once that corporeal form makes prime matter corporeal, then a substantial form comes in and informs 
this corporeal substance. Thomas denies that because he thinks, well, then you would have two substances. The, reality, the corporeality of prime matter comes from substantial form. So substantial form gives dimensionality to prime matter. And then the actual dimensions by which the substantial form is individuated comes from the matter which is thereby to be given uh, corporeality. So what does that indicate? It indicates that the corporeal nature of the person as a whole is not down to its matter, but down to its substantial form. Its whole bodily nature comes from its substantial form. The matter mm. just, the prime matter allows that to be realized as a passive receiving principle, but it's the substantial form which determines the bodily nature of the individual being. Now, what's the substantial form of the human? It's the rational soul. So the rational, so the individual supposit, suppositing for that rational soul continues to exist after death, and it's that rational soul which carries with it the principle of corporeality for the thing. All you need, then, is prime matter to uh, for that to be realized. Um, reality, but the matter doesn't add anything of positive ontological value. It only delimits uh, the substantial form. Now, uh, Stump just, uh, you know, brought this to my attention. I'm developing that thought. So the way that I've developed it may not be the way that she developed it. So I'm developing it in this way. I want to go another way. So I don't want to attribute that to her. So my point here is that the corporeal nature of our bodies, okay, comes from our substantial form. That substantial form remains, and the individual supposit, which supposits for that form, remains. So um, all of the corporeal nature, the individual supposit, the individual act existence, the individual rational soul, remains after death. All that's missing is the prime matter, which that substantial form informs um, and gives it its corporeality, corporeal nature, makes it this body here, which is mine. Uh, that's all that's missing. So all that's missing is um, something which, doesn't add anything of positive ontological value to the being anyway well yeah, so you can always you're count not on uh, dr in a separate... yeah you can always you can always count on dr stump for a cool little insight like that can't you that's fun that's awesome um yeah. so sorry go, go ahead finish your, yeah. yeah finish your thoughts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that that would be you know so in the previous episode, we just we kind of looked at the metaphysics of the matter. So here we're kind of you know delving more into kind of those sort of dicey issues which pit us against the survivalists, and these mm -hmm. sorts of issues: the weak supplementation principle, uh, the fact that supposit supposit for a nature that it's the supposit the praise through the nature, um, and then Stump's final point there about corporeality. Um, I think these are issues which are decisive in the debate and uh, require further attention. Because simply to say that, you know, the human substance, you know, undergoes substantial change at death is not enough to say that the person doesn't subsist. Because of course death is a substantial change. This substance, which I am. Um, oh, Don had this very question. He, he, he wanted yeah. to know is does death have a substantial change? So, yeah, why don't you just keep building on this point since you're already on the topic? Mm hmm. Yeah, so I am an individual supposit, and I supposit for uh, uh, my body and soul, the, the composite union of my body and soul, right? Whenever that body and soul are disunited, there is a substantial change which is undergone there, okay? But then that the supposit changes, okay, substantially. You still have the same supposit, all right? It's simply missing a component that it was previously constituted by. You do have a change of substance. It's no longer the corporeal human being. Let's say for definitional purposes, we'll call the human being the corporeal thing. You no longer have the corporeal human being, but you still have the human person because you still have the individual supposit. So without the um, without due attention to the, the supposit nature distinction, the, the debate has tended to focus on that substantial change that occurs at death that if that substance, you know, is corrupted, then I am corrupted. But once you put in the supposed nature distinction, it all changes because all it means mm, then mm -hmm. is that the nature itself changes, but the supposed subsists and the supposed is now constituted by the soul, but it has the same active existence, okay? It's the same individual active existence um, for the supposed, which is now supposedly only for the soul uh, and not for... Uh, the body that I previously had. Once you throw that in, then the notion that death involves a sub 
substantial change doesn't threaten um, the unity of identity or the subsistence of identity uh, before and after death. Yeah, that's great. I think that's, uh, yeah, I guess uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I've picked the team just yet, Gavin, but uh, these, are some, <laughs> these, are, these are some very strong considerations here that you've, you've put forward in these, in these two episodes. So are there any other um, points you want to make in general uh, before we turn to some more questions and comments from the audience here? Um, no, just to, I mean, just, I, I, I like to the, the, the focus on that supposit, um, nature distinction. Um, also I see somebody's asked, you know, would I debate, uh, Christopher Tomachevsky there? Um, no, I'm sorry. Don't do, uh, online debates and my debates. Occur yeah, you, in you guys are usually, you guys, are, yeah, you guys are usually teaming up, uh, to defend <laughs> like <laughs> classical theism and stuff. We love, we love Chris. Great guy. Uh, Maybe maybe we'll organize like yeah. a roundtable dialogue in the future or something like that um, <laughs> uh, on this topic. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll see. And uh, Chris is always welcome back on the the channel as well if he ever wants to you know elaborate his mm -hmm. points further and and stuff like that. So this yeah. is all in just you yeah. know this is always all in good good spirited you know inner Catholic to mystic dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I say I don't do online debates, so I, I don't do that. But, you know, it's just in the public locations and the conferences where I would engage in that way. But I do do MMA, cage fighting, happily get into the cage, you know, if you want to make that happen. You can happen, settle Pat. it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, yeah I think uh, <laughs> I think we're already planning for that when you come over to the States, right? <laughs> yeah, bring yeah, definitely. Along. You know, I'll bring all the MMA gear over and, you know, we'll have a good, we'll, we'll have a Royal Rumble, a nice shark tank, you know, you, me, Jim, Christopher, if he's over, that'd be great fun. Settle, settle it the old fashioned way. Right. Yeah. I love it. That's all. That's awesome. Exactly. Let's, uh, let's see here. I, there's some other good questions and comments I want to, I want to highlight. Um, oh, actually, by the way, real quick, um, because you, right now the plan is for you, um, you'll be in the States in November for the, for the ACPQ uh, conference. Right. And this is the topic you'll be, be presenting on. Is that right, Gavin? Yeah. Yeah. All being well, it just uh, some more details and arrangements sorted out, but all being well, um, I should be over in November for the ACPA and um, yeah, I'll be presenting on, on this topic. Okay. Awesome. So could give people reason to buy some tickets to that. If you want to come hang out, I haven't made a full commitment to being there yet, but if uh, <coughs> it's, it's looking highly probable. All right. Um, Julio wants to know, will, will we be continuing our series on the day ente? Well, I sure hope so. Gavin, what do you say? Yeah, yeah, that that that'll be cool. I I, I left it down the day on my shelves. Do you ever go to your shelves and you have to see you have to get you know a book or something? You see a book that you haven't read in a while, and you're like, oh, I'll get that and read that. And I, I pulled that down off the shelf. It's a nice edition that I have of it. And um, yeah, I've I've been reading through the day on again. You know, especially refreshing on the uh, the earlier chapters, which is related to this stuff on the supposed nature distinction. You know how the the humanity of Socrates is present in Socrates, and how the Given the distinction of supposit and nature, we can say that Socrates is a human, but Socrates is humanity because he only possesses he supposits for humanity. But he can't. We cannot say that Socrates is humanity, but that he has humanity. So, yeah, I've been boning up in those earlier chapters because, um, well, you, you know, work. I mean, it's really focused on you know the the chapter four with the real distinction and the the proof of God. But I've been going back over it. You know, it's 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 a masterpiece, really. It is. Yeah, it definitely is. And what was he like 29 when he wrote that or something like that? Uh, so in the 1250s, so he would have been in the 30s. OK, so around that age. Yeah. Impressive stuff, to say the least. Mm. Um, Julio wants to know, when mm. will our Catholic Answers book hit the shelves? Looking forward to ordering it. Well, Gavin and I submitted the manuscript, so uh, it's in their hands right now. Mm. And whenever they do their editing and kick it back to us, um, we'll we'll do our thing and kick it back to them. And hopefully we won't have to have multiple rounds of, of edits, but uh, that's, that's the update. But I, I have no, unless you've heard something that I haven't Gavin, I have no official release date or anything like that yet. I'm, I'm hoping within a year at this point, but um, yeah, who knows? yeah, I'd hope so. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the yeah. publishing it's, world it's, can last forever. These sorts of things. It, it can last forever, but things can also turn around very quickly too um and i know at yeah. least for uh catholic answers for people this is this is the first book i've ever done with catholic answers so i love working with them i, I write a bunch of articles and do other work with them this is the first book i've done with them but people have told me that sometimes um 
it, it, it can be it can seem like it's taking forever and then like in a month boom <laughs> your book's out so it could it could turn around very quickly guys uh so we'll see. Of course, I'll let everybody know as soon as as soon as I get any word. And I appreciate uh, you guys asking and the support. We're obviously very excited to get that book out there. Uh, Cole wants to know, is corruptionism basically annihilationism? Are they the same ideas but different terms? I don't think so, because um, annihilationism is that uh, body, soul, and its supposits um, will be annihilated. Um, whereas corruptionism um, wants to say that uh, there, there's corruption of uh, the individual. So that only a part or a portion of the individual remains, uh, the full individual doesn't remain. So uh, the, the corruptionist wants to affirm that only the soul of St. Peter remains, but that St. Peter doesn't remain, you know, with death. And so St. Peter is corrupted, but as I think what want to say, that it, his soul is annihilated, ceases to be. Um, so everything that formerly made up St. Peter just ceases to be a thing. Sorry, Gavin, you broke up a little bit at the end there, but I think I, I caught most of what you were saying. Yeah, so ju just the distinction is that um, annihilationism wants to affirm that uh, everything that formerly made up St. Peter um, gone. isn't gone. Annihilated death, whereas corruptism holds that just that St. Peter's corrupted, but that his soul remains. Yeah, and they're also different debates really i mean survivalism and corruption is a debate about the interim state right survivalists and corruptionists really are going to agree at least so far as i can tell about general eschatology uh heaven hell and purgatory mm -hmm. annihilationism mm -hmm. is is a is a disagreement later on down the line right of whether god instead mm -hmm. of people going to hell are just completely annihilated poofed out of existence for example so they're just they're just different debates mm -hmm. uh, really mm -hmm. yeah 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 i see that mount athos on the hypostatic union the hypostasis of the word yeah let me try and pull that one up we got a lot of good comments today guys so let me uh i think this is the one you're thinking of here yeah Gavin? that's okay the one. let me read it here yeah. so uh people listening can see what's up so mount athos says i'm curious the hypostasis of the word, according to Aquinas, didn't die, but the nature did. This was in virtue of him being God. So can we say that a person doesn't die either? A suppositum, but just the nature. I mean, the human nature of the word. Yeah, good question, Gavin. What are your thoughts on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so death is the separation, the corruption of the soul from the body. Now, in um, in Christ, you have two natures. You've got the human nature and you've got the divine nature, but you've got the single supposit, which is the person of the word. That single supposit, supposits for both natures. Okay, so Trinitarian theology, you know, which Thomas Joseph White just came today for me. So Trinitarian theology, the, the person of the word supposits for the divine, is a supposit of the divine nature. And that person of the word also supposits um, for the human nature. So the natures are united in that personal supposit, but they're not united with each other. Okay, um, so that's, you know, that's Chalcedonian Christology. So that with with Christ's death on the cross, his human soul, i.e. his rational soul, was divided from his body. But the human soul and the rational soul were not divided from the person of the word. They remained united to the person of the word. So they're disunited from each other, remained united to the person of the word. So... Um, uh, whilst the body is in the tomb, it's still united to the person of the word. Uh, the soul goes down into, you know, Gehenna, the limbo of the fathers, Abraham's bosom. Um, uh, that soul is still united to the person of the word um, down in Abraham's bosom. So you've got the body being united to the person of the word in the tomb and the soul being united to the person of the word in Abraham's bosom. The difference for um, us mere humans um, is that... Um, we are constituted, okay? Our supposit is constituted by our components, i.e. our matter and our form that constitutes our right. supposit mm -hmm. um, and our active existence um, yeah. as well. So um, whenever death occurs uh, for us, uh, the, the supposit remains because it's the same active existence re that remains, but it only now supposits for uh, our rational soul. It no longer supposits for the body which is, you know, mm -hmm. decaying, whereas Christ, the, the supposit of Christ, the person of the word, remained united um, to the body in the tomb. It, it, it's still supposited for the body in the tomb um, whenever body and soul were separated. And, that, and that's something distinctive about Christ because the, the personal supposit is uh, the, the divine person.
Right. Excellent. Excellent, Gavin. Let me just highlight this one real quick. Cole says, I apologize if it was a dumb question. Never heard of corruption until, until today. So I quickly looked it up. It sounded similar to annihilation at, at first, but I believe, uh, but I see they believe the soul will live. Hey, not a dumb question, man. This is yeah. uh this is a, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're here to help however we can. And, and to be fair, like this is a, it's a pretty specialized debate, right? <laughs> right. Mm, like, most yeah. people, most people, even most people, you know, who, who tune in this channel probably are not going to be familiar with the survivalist corruptionist debate. So yeah, please, no, no apologies needed. And uh, we were happy that you uh, submitted the question. So mm. good stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a good one um, from three gifts, three rules. that just came up. Um, is heaven immaterial? Um, you go ahead and start answering it and I'll try and find it and pull it up here, Gavin. So it's, it's the latest uh, comment that uh, just came up there. Um, so here we go. Yep. Uh, yeah. for, uh, is heaven immaterial? How do we, how do the physical glorified bodies of Mary and Christ live there now? Is the human nature of Christ located somewhere? So kind of three questions there. Take any or all of them, Gavin, yeah. your call. Mm -hmm. So is heaven immaterial? Well, it depends. Um, so, uh, heaven could mean, um, the separated state of the soul. Okay. After death, um, because you know, the, the, the individual supposing for the soul, is present face to face presence of God, and obviously that's that's great, that's bliss, that's wonderful. Um, it could mean that. It could mean the resurrected state. So it could mean the state after that separated state. Whenever the you know that supposit will again you know have a body um, for which it is supposing, uh, and that'll be the resurrected glorified state, uh, whereby the glory you know of you know that the soul has through you know. Uh, being in the presence of God is reflected in the body. And that's the resurrected state. And then Christ and our ladies' uh, bodies, you know, where are they? Let me take that last quote, that, that last issue first. Um, I believe that the, uh, the, the the teaching is that uh, Christ's um, resurrected body and our ladies' body um, exists now in the eschaton, which is the, the final state that we will all exist in when we're all resurrected. So they're, they are there already. Um, and because, you know, it, it, God is eternal and everything, there's no problem for that being present uh, to God. So their bodies are there already, and that's where we will be whenever we are resurrected. Mm -hmm. um, so th they're existing in the eschaton right now, and, th and that's where we will be when we're resurrected. But we'll also go through the intermediate state, and the intermediate state is when our... Uh, souls will be separated from our bodies so that we will exist uh supposedly for that soul uh god willing in in the face-to-face -face presence of god um and so that that will be an immaterial state because the soul uh is immaterial so we will exist in that immaterial state now the resurrected state obviously obviously is not an immaterial state it is a bodily state mm -hmm. um details of which see nt right who does a really sort of you know in-depth job pointing out that the jewish belief and the christian belief has always been that uh, the resurrection is a full blown bodily resurrection it's not some non-bodily uh resurrection but yeah that's that that's going to be a uh a bodily state that we'll enjoy and again that will be heaven because there will be no it'll be immediate access to the presence of god gods will not be shrouded or, or clouded from us in that state yeah very good gavin is there a uh, final question or comment here you want to close out with gavin before we maybe tease some uh some announcements of work that you're currently working on um i'm, ju I'm just you know sort of you know pulling up through the uh the comments um well, there's a, there's a nice wee question there that sort of takes us away from the main topic. It's from uh, Julio Alonso. Um, uh, question for Gavin. How, how are your study and writing habits? Which recommendations do you have in that area for university students? Yeah, that's a cool question. Take this one. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, I was a late bloomer, so I never really sort of got into the way of studying stuff like that at my undergraduate I didn't really sort of, you know, thrive until I got into postgraduate work. And the way I treated it was um, imagine that your, um, your your university work is like a nine to five job. Treat it as a nine to five job. I, I know working in academia now, when we work out, you know, the credit ratings for each of the, the courses that we teach, there are a certain amount of credits. The credits mm. represent how many hours of input 
that you should be putting into your work. And it basically works out that you should be doing a 40 hour working week, uh, nine to five. So um, that's what I did. I treated it like a nine to five job. And um, when, when it came to study writing habits, usually what I like to do is when I sit down at my desk, and this doesn't always happen, but when I sit down at my desk, I like to do a bit of reading first. Reading is your kind of, you know, your warm up, right. you know, get, that, that, that's what you do. That warms you up. And so I like to read something nice, usually for about an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I start thinking about my, my writing projects, maybe the ones I want to engage with. And if they're writing projects that I need to do a bit of reading about, let's say survivalism and corruptionism, I'll get that focused literature and I'll sort of go through it and, you know, have it before me because I'm trying to get something out of the text which is contributing to to what I'm writing about. And I'll usually have my my writing project up. And a lot of the times what you'll see um, as I'm putting things together is that I, you know, cut and paste things in bold, put them, you know, kind of at the top of the the text just to remind me that they're there to direct me to them. I'll I'll leave reminders for myself in the text. But um, generally when it comes to the research and the writing, I like to get my focused texts around me and, and I'm trying to draw from those what I need uh, for the particular issue at hand. And that that's going to take up the, the main part of the day. Um, if I don't have lectures to write or, you know, scripts to mark or whatever. And then towards the end of the day, I kind of, you know, again, <laughs> it's kind of like working out. You start with a warm up, you do the heavy stuff, and then you have the cool down. And the cool down, again, is reading some cool stuff that I'm interested in, usually which has nothing to do um, with... Uh, what I'm writing or what I'm researching. So, I mean, I've just got, you know, Thomas Joseph White's book on the Trinity. Um, I'm reading Jim's book at the minute. Um, I've got a few other books. I'm, I'm reading a lot of William Desmond at the minute. Uh, thinking of branching off into Hegel as well. Not thinking of publishing on any of that stuff, but, you know, that, that sort of helps me wind down and it keeps me abreast of other areas of philosophy, which I may not sort of want to publish in or specialize in, but it just still keeps me tuned in to those other areas of philosophy. That th- Those are my general habits. Um, plus, I have a very strong and very unhealthy caffeine addiction. Um, <laughs> so, that yeah. Helps. That so helps, that, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> that, that, that's a general help. And uh, I would also say, and I mean, Pat, I think you probably agree with this, um, mm-hmm. make sure to work out. You know, include oh, yeah. a workout in your day at some point. You know, it's got unbelievable benefits, you know, for mm-hmm. the, the sort of the mental life. Mm-hmm. Um, usually first thing in the morning, I like to get my workout in. Yeah. And I, yeah. So I, Gavin, our, our, uh, our method is largely the same. I always begin my day with, with some reading. I think that's right. It not only gets the, you know, the intellectual gears turning, but if you read something that's really well written, you sort of absorb um, a good prose style too, mm. if you've noticed that. Right. Uh, so mm. I always like, if I, if I want to like write and think, well, uh, I'll always just go back to Mortimer Adler. Cause he's got such mm. a great prose style and such clear thinking. Like if I've got, especially on a popular level book is like, this is, this guy's style is what I want in my ear. Mm-hmm. Not, not Bernard Lonergan, right. Mm-hmm. Brilliant, yeah. but yeah. not, I don't want to write like that. Right. <laughs> so like mm. I will, depending on what I'm writing, That'll focus me on what I want to read because we all we all imitate and emulate mm-hmm. various ways. You know, don't don't mm-hmm. steal, obviously, but you will absorb kind of like what's immediately around you and and that'll mm-hmm. kind of come back out. So I try I try to keep that in mind and make my reading selections for the day relevant to the type of writing I'm I'm gonna do. Mm-hmm. Um, except for, of course, if it's on a specific, you know, topic, which almost always is, I do like you, Gavin, like to have the most relevant literature in, in front of me there mm-hmm. as well. So we're very similar in 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 method, almost like eerily similar because i don't think we've ever talked about it before (laughs) it's just must be the irish blood in us or something like that but uh yeah and then yeah no i work out uh, you know usually around like 11 ish i'm like a midday workout guy and then the only Mm. other and then same thing like once the heavy lifting's done of the writing and reading a day i always i always keep reading but that's kind of like my my fun reading like what else do i want to learn about it's not immediately relevant to what i'm wanting to publish on or anything uh like that but then also, you know, having some other, I think, creative outlet, uh, Gab, never, we're similar again, because we both are into <laughs> music, right? So I think, yeah. it's, I think that's really important too, right? To have something other than just, yeah, exactly. He's whipping out the Jackson Kelly right there. So there you go. I think it, the, because it just, it helps you make, it helps you be more creative, if nothing else, I think. Um, and when you just put further demands on your 
on your brain like that. I just I just find that uh, you tend to be more productive. It's 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 specific adaptations, right? Stuff mm. like that. So uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, work out, learn a musical instrument or a different language, like have something else that's challenge you intellectually aside from philosophy, challenge mm. yourself physically. Uh, I can't recommend the caffeine addiction because ca that's where we differ very dramatically. Uh, I can do about like two cups of coffee. Any more than that, I just start shaking too much. I can't even fo I can't even focus. Right. Mm. And uh, try to get a good night's sleep. At least for me, that's uh, that's that's important. I, I, if you can't tell, I'm a little slow these past couple episodes because, well, we just had a new baby and I've had these these uh, these gigs. So my sleep has actually been quite poor. And uh, when my sleep gets poor it's just hard for me to even form sentences. So sleep, <laughs> sleep is, sleep is super critical for me. Is yeah. that for you? Can you, how, how do you function? Uh, if you don't, if you don't sleep well, are you, uh, some people can seem to do just fine. Not me. If I don't sleep well, I just can't, I just cannot make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I tend to, um, I would maybe get about on average about six hours of sleep mm -hmm. a night. Um, I, intellectually, I, f I function, I tend to function quite well, but I think that's because, um, Whenever you know that there's kind of a goal that I have to do, I just get switched on and do it. Um, and then you know, I might end up having a breakdown, you know, or a crash and burn sort of you know later in the month. So it may, it may be that the sleep doesn't affect me on a on a lack of sleep doesn't affect me on a day to day basis. Then at the end of the month, it'll just crash and just, burn, just, just builds up, and then you have this yeah. one cataclysmic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's just like a mushroom cloud, you know, whatever, you know, right, right. the kids can't even look at me. Right, the, right, 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 right. That's another point uh, which is interesting to note is that um, when you're working, when you're you're researching, you're writing, you're studying, um, you know, your publications, you know, great works of philosophy, they don't come within a perfect setup, you know, where you're tuned into the platonic forms and you've got peace and quiet and, you know, in your study and everything's perfect. That doesn't happen. Now, I'm not going to say that any of my work has been great works in philosophy, but a lot of the work that, you know, people have read and commented on and sort of asked me about, there are works that occurred whenever the kids were driving me nuts, mm -hmm. whenever I didn't have anywhere to start. I mean, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the study of our um, home here, um, but a, a lot of my works weren't written in a study or in an office. They were written at a dining table, you know, whilst the kids were crawling about. They, they, they were written sitting in, in my living room, you know, with the laptop on my knee and, you know, the child potty training and just willing that the child didn't need to use the potty because it was finishing. So actually in the in the Deente book that I wrote where I was talking about, you know. Which is a great work of philosophy. <laughs> It, it, it's so funny. There was there, there's a part, and I remember this vividly. There's a part in that book where I talk about you know God being pure essay, and then I start you know talking about Exodus, and you know, do, you know, should we take seriously that God appeared to somebody? Because where did this notion of God as you know you know being itself, you know, He who is, come from? So maybe we should take seriously. And I remember writing this, you know, just having this, you know, in my mind writing it. And my son, who was just body training, he's running about, and I'm like, just don't need you. Don't need to go. You know, I'm I'm ignoring whatever's happening here. Um. So yeah, it's, it's things like that. You know, these works of philosophy. You know, your research. You know, is going to be interrupted by life. Yep. Let your life take over. You can mm -hmm. always return to the research, and you can always return to the writing. There's no time. There's no time limit. Okay. There, there isn't, you know, because you, you could be dead tomorrow. And if you're just, you know, sort of really, you know, sort of, you know, getting annoyed or angry with the kids. And we've all done it, you know, mm -hmm. as parents, oh, yeah. we've all done oh, it. Yeah. You do get, that happens. You do get grouchy. You know, that's time and purgatory for that. Um, <laughs> or this is the purgatory time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but you, you could be dead tomorrow and you've got all your books that you've written, you know, which is unfinished. Um but, you know, you got angry, annoyed at the kids. You know, you didn't spend more time with the family. Let your life take over. Right, because, right. you know, if you do make any achievements in philosophy and publications or whatever, they'll feel so much more rewarding that you did them whilst at the same time being devoted to your family, your friends. Oh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, that you, you lived a good life. You're not, I take it most people aren't Aquinas in a cell, you know, reading, writing preaching for 18 hours a day you know we're, we're, we're i want to say normal people but you know we're family people we live in the world so mm -hmm. live in the world um right. and don't let you know the, the the devotion to philosophy take over your philosophy will get better um if you allow yourself uh, to live life free from the philosophy and come back to it 
Yeah, such a beautiful reminder, Gavin. Uh, and it, you're just right about about all those points. In fact, when I was writing uh, this book right here, there was numerous <laughs> horrible episodes. I mean, I think one time, you know, the kids have those those like little toys they push around, like the toy lawnmowers and mm. stuff like that. Somehow, like Roan's diaper came off, and it was full of the stuff diapers are full of. Got, yeah. caught, got caught in that toy, pushed it around like the entire kitchen as I was writing the book, which means the entire kitchen essentially got covered in, in crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then that, that I'm pretty sure that was the day that, uh, yeah, I think that set Christine off into labor that day because she was pregnant with the other kids. So it's messy. It's all yeah. messy, right? It's, 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 it's Certainly I'm not, uh, it doesn't sound like you are, Gavin, writing in some perfect ivory tower with your, yeah. it's just, that's just not how it is. But anyways, yeah. we, we, we made up for it today. Um, uh, we went, uh, had a great day with the kids today. We gave mom some rest because she's still recovering from the birth. So I took all the other kids to mass. We went to a local, uh, they have like a minor league baseball game here. Did that. Uh, so we actually had a really busy day before the podcast here and had a, mm. had a ton of fun. So it was, it was great. And that's, that's the stuff that like, yeah, you're so right. Like you will, you will regret mm -hmm. uh, ignoring your family and friends to write that paper or to write the book, but you will not regret uh the day that I just had with my kids, uh, even if it means I didn't write that day, you know what yeah. I mean? And that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's so true. And that's a lesson that sometimes you got to learn the hard way, right? Is because, mm -hmm. you know, we're not perfect, but, um, yeah. Yeah. Good to have those reminders, Gavin. Always appreciate it. So, all right, before we say goodbye, because we're kind of just, you know, ambling about now, uh, what are you working on? What can people expect from you, um, coming down the pipeline? Mm -hmm. So let's see. Um, well, there's the collected articles book. Um, which is more or less complete. Um, I finished, uh, just about finished the final chapter. <laughs> it was so weird. Um, Fieser uh, brought out that philosophy compass um, article where he talks about the different approaches to classical theism and how oh, yeah. Thomas... Ex yeah, great article, right. Mm -hmm. Thomas is a first cause approach to classical theism and not a perfect being approach. And I was literally writing this final chapter of my collected articles <laughs> book pointing out that there's three different approaches a first cause approach a perfect being approach and the necessary being approach mm -hmm. and the thomas is the the first cause approach and there fieser goes and publishes that article perfect for my purposes but you know mine hasn't come out yet but uh yeah so you're bringing that to completion hopefully going to send the manuscript off soon um Let's see, given all this work that I've been doing sort of on survivalism and corruptionism, the resurrection book is really just, you know, just charging on ahead. Awesome, awesome. I've, I've got this chapter on supposed nature distinction, you know, the, the survival of the supposed after death. See, once I have that, see, once I can show that the supposed remains after death with its, with its individual active existence, then, you know, the resurrection just falls into place because if that's a posit, then, you know, ends up suppositing for prime matter it will be the same body that you have at the resurrection because all, the principle of your corporeality remains and you're suppositing for that and your active existence remains so it's the same body yeah, which you're great. going to get mm -hmm. so i can play on ahead into that thank god um what else am i working on yeah well i'm working on this paper for uh the acpa um hopefully you know all you know, all the details of that, you know, I'll get my tickets booked. Uh, my wife pointed out there's a, there's a direct flight uh, by British Airways from London straight to New Orleans. Oh, nice. Um, so hopefully I can get that uh, nice direct flight, which would be nice. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, other than that, um, I'm, I'm sure there's other stuff that I'm doing as well. Other than that, I'm, I'm taking the summer to do an awful lot of martial arts, an awful lot of fight training. And I'm just you know, training about five days a week, you know, fighting, sparring, rolling, all of it, you know, because when I get back uh, at the semester time, that kind of falls by the wayside. So I right. just want to stay in the game with that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's that's everything I'm doing. I'm sure there's more that I've forgotten about, but sure, you know, I'll share it on Facebook, whatever gets published. And we'll have you back on soon because we want to continue. Uh, we want to do a series on Dante. We haven't started it yet. We did the yeah. one on the principles of nature, which if people haven't seen that yet, I'm going to encourage them to go back. Uh, through the channel and uh, find the series Gavin and I did on the principles of nature. If you're into mm. the, if you're into philosophy of nature and metaphysics, then that's, yeah. that's, that's necessary material as far as I'm concerned. And, and Gavin did a killer job as always. So please it's free. It's on the channel. Please take advantage of that. And then, uh, yeah, we'll have to coordinate and get the one on the, on uh, Dante going. Yeah, that'll be great. I'll, I'll probably go to a different room in the house with better, you know, <laughs> internet connection. I'm, I'm sorry. I kept cutting out there. 
Well, it's all right. Hey, you know, it's you get what you pay for here at Philosophy of People, and uh, it's 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 well well worth it. No, it was fine. It was a uh, few. No, it's awesome. So, Gavin, as always, we appreciate you being here. And uh, gentle listeners, thank you for tuning in. Please like, share, comments. Of course, you're welcome to engage in the larger conversation. So please do. You know, please do because your comments and your engagement actually helps the channel out a lot. So please give us your thoughts, your questions, anything. Put it in the video after the stream, and we'll catch you guys next time. Adios.